So I was thinking about what to talk about tonight, and you know I usually cover current events on my show, and I want to briefly touch on what's going on in Virginia first, which Rod just referenced quickly. Uh, you know, because I think today, although I don't think that most of the solutions that we are going to need and hopefully we'll find in this country will be purely through politics and certainly through the political class that we have right now, uh, I do think today is an incredibly, incredibly important moment for the, the future of this country. What's happening in Virginia right now is sort of a bellwether for everything that this conference has been about. If, if wokeism and leftism and collectivism is going to continue to be on the march, it's going to go through McAuliffe, it's going to go through Virginia, and suddenly in the last two weeks it feels like maybe that isn't going to happen. And, you know, I try not to spend too much time on the uh, self-imposed mental institution that is Twitter, but I was looking around Twitter this morning and you can sort of feel it. You can sort of feel people going, man, the anti-woke people, if we can get a win, and it doesn't even necessarily mean that we love everything about Youngkin, it doesn't mean that we agree with all his policies or think he's the best politician or any of that stuff, or that politicians are the ones to fix it, as I said. But if we can get a win right now, just something, that it might start the turnaround. I think we can all feel that. We're finally all kind of having enough of this, right? We let it happen, I referenced this last night, you know, it was like, all of these kids that were in college with blue hair and genderless and screaming at professors and, you know, causing, uh, what was it, Berkeley to spend something like $400,000 to secure the campus when very scary four foot seven Ben Shapiro showed up. It's like, he's very small. He's actually in my pocket. You guys want to see him? Um, there's a feeling, though, that they've overstepped, right? They've really overstepped, overstepped by coming for the kids. We're gonna first, we're gonna inject the kids with the vaccine, and it really doesn't even matter what you think about vaccines, and in, in a certain respect, it doesn't even matter what you think about mandates. The fact that the FDA, I'm sure many of you saw the video just a few days ago, the FDA board was uh, talking about vaccine mandates for children, and one of the doctors actually said on video, we don't know what it'll do, that's why we have to give it to the kids. I mean, this is, this is the level of craziness that we are dealing with, right? They are, they are using our children as experiments. They are putting people in masks and locking people at home. We know all of the endless things that this is doing to us psychologically and culturally. I come from a place called California. Thank you, one person booing it. The, the one other Californian here, obviously. Uh, where, where it's, it's like living in another country, truly. I mean, these last couple days in Florida where I've seen your faces, people smile and aren't afraid of you. I mean, we've done something so incredibly dangerous and look how quickly they did it. Look how quickly they did it. And that's why last night I said, you know, you have to give the devil his due here. We can all run around and say wokeism is ridiculous and these people are buffoons and they don't know what they're talking about and they, okay, fine, so be it. They all seem like clowns. You kind of have to admire it, right? Look how much destruction they have created in really a couple of years. And I know we can talk about sort of the long march through the institutions and this was all happening in colleges 20 years ago. I, I get it, you know, I talk to some of my conservative friends now, you know, people that I thought were, were very scary right-wingers like Dennis Prager and Larry Elder and Glenn Beck and I'll say something and they'll go, yeah, Dave, that's what I was saying 30 years ago, thank you, I appreciate that. Uh, but it just in the last couple of years, fueled by big tech, this, this woke thing has done so much destruction. And that's why I really do think that this election today in Virginia is so important. And it's funny because I live in California. Here we are in Florida. It should probably have nothing to do with any of us, right? Unless any of you here live in Virginia, in which case I hope you voted a couple times before you got here. Um, Unless, unless you do, it really shouldn't have anything to do with this. I mean, the, the federalist system was set up so that the states would be separate and mostly independent, and the federal government would do a little bit to make sure we're, you know, in essence, not at war and we're having trade with each other and things of that nature. Um, but suddenly it feels very important. It feels very important that this Virginia race go the right way because one of the things that I talk about often on my show is we need a little hope, 
we need, you know, I toured with Jordan Peterson. He would often talk about that star in the distance. He would reference Pinocchio and when you wish upon a star. And I think we've sort of lost that in America right now. We're all sort of wandering around. We wake up every morning. You go online or you watch the news, you see the next ridiculous thing that these people are throwing on us, whether it's you know the gender stuff or the vaccination stuff or just, or now Joe Biden is gonna solve climate. I mean, the guy fell asleep at the talk yesterday. Did you see that? Like, we, we are just inundated with stupidity and we need, we need some hope. So I think today there is some hope. And uh, I'll be talking with Jonathan Isaac, who you guys, might know uh, who's the Orlando Magic basketball player uh, who's come out against vaccine mandates. We just had a little talk. I'm going to talk to him. Yeah. You know, it's not an easy feat for a guy like him. You know, Kyrie Irving is the one that most people know. He's a big star. The guy's got probably got 80 million bucks or something. Jonathan Isaac's only been in the league for a couple of years. He has a huge, bright future that he's put on the line. Uh, but we just, I don't know if it's even public yet, but we added, I'll be interviewing him tonight, uh, right up here uh, before J.D. Vance speaks. And he's ready to step into a wider world and realize that I don't know that he considers himself a conservative or a Republican or that he'd ever thought he'd talk at a conference like this, but he was very excited to come here. And we need that sort of thing. We need more and more people to realize that the machine is not gonna save us. And again, great, let's get Yunkin in. Let's hopefully get a little signal out to the system that, that things you know, can turn around. But it's just not the politicians that are gonna save us. It's us that is gonna save us. That really is the truth. So, you know, I was thinking, a lot of people know, I would say, roughly my story. You know, I was, I was a lefty, I was a progressive, and then there's a, a moment that has uh, been seen probably 50 million times or something like that on YouTube, where as a lefty, I sat down with uh, conservative or really libertarian talk show host Larry Elder, who you all know, and we started talking about systemic racism, and I said, Larry, you know, but what about systemic racism? And as a lefty, I kind of just believed it existed because I said it, and that's really what they believe about a lot of things. You just say something, and well, I said it, so it must be true. And uh, I'm sure most of you have seen the clip, but Larry really just disassembled me. He did it, he did it just beautifully and, and uh, sort of like operating. He just had stats and numbers and went through everything. And I don't know how many people can say that their best and worst career moment were at the exact same time, but I, but I really believe that I can say that about myself because it was my worst moment for very obvious reasons. I, I got into a debate not ready, not armed with facts, not ready to counter the ideas of someone who I really should have known has been doing this for 30 years and he wasn't just gonna lay over and, and just let me you know, run, run across him. Uh, but I think it was my best moment also because at the time uh, we were on Aura TV, I had, a, I had a big staff in the control room and we taped it and it was gonna air the next day and I walked into the control room and the uh, producers said to me, you know, Dave, we'll cut that. We'll cut that moment. That, we're obviously not going to put that up. And I don't know what was going on in my head exactly, but I thought, no, we have to leave that. That was the true moment. If, if yeah. <laughs> if there's any purpose of being an interviewer or trying to explain to people what I believe or listening to people who know more than me, then when something true happens, we certainly can't cut that. And over the next couple of days, you know, it got cut across YouTube and, you know, all the usual headlines, you know, conservative destroys libtard and the rest of it. And I was like, oh, God, what a headache this is going to be. But, you know, within about 48 hours, I started looking at the comments, which is not something I recommend any sane person do. But I was looking and I saw a lot of people were kind of like, you know, it seemed like Ruben paid attention. It seemed like he wanted to continue the conversation. And I really did. And, and then I started having conversations with some of the people that I referenced earlier, like Shapiro and Prager and, Black, and Beck and all of these people. And I realized that there was a much wider world. And, and a world, which I think sort of now I can bring this into why we're all here, a world which we have got to save. I mean, we are handing it to people who don't deserve it. And we all know it, right? We all know something is very wrong. And you know, no matter what, you think you have, they want it, and they are coming for it. There is no norm. Look how different the world is right now as we stand here on November 1st, 2021, than it was in February 
of 2020, right? I mean, it basically, we are, we are in a completely different world in less than two years. You remember, we used to talk about things just two years ago, less than two years ago. We had never heard the phrase two weeks to flatten the curve. Now we don't hear it anymore because they decided it was useless, it wasn't needed. We don't talk about herd immunity. They have just pushed and pushed and pushed. We have you know, guys like Fauci up there telling us to double mask while he's sending emails to his friends telling them that the masks don't work and they actually could be worse because you might touch your face or you'll adjust your mask more so you do touch your face more and, and that's not gonna work. And the, and the litany, I don't have to go into all of the things that they have all said that they don't do and Gavin Newsom you know, locking kids at home while he's eating at French Laundry and every other, I mean, every single Democrat politician on this, uh, you know, the height of absurdity as they flaunt their own rules in our faces and all of these things. But look, the world is very, very different. And the purpose, I think, of this conference and why I wanted to come here, even though it's, it's perhaps a little bit out of my main lane, is that I don't really care what our differences are. I really don't. I know that some of us in this room, yeah. And I don't mean that to, I don't mean that to be glib or, or something. I, I, mean that, I mean that quite literally. Like, I know we have some political differences in, in this room. Uh, for those of you that saw the panel last night, we went through some of those differences, and they are, they are pretty intense, right? These are deeply held religious and philosophical and political positions that we hold differently than each other. And that's important. So I don't want to be dismissive of those important issues. And we will have to deal with all of those issues. But I think that the purpose of this conference is to go, OK, we got a bigger problem at the moment. The problem is that the same old thing that caused all of our ancestors to come to this country, pretty much everyone in this room, think about your ancestors. Why did they come here? Whether you're one generation off, whether you're first generation, whether you're six generations in, everybody in America, in essence, uh, with the exception of Native Americans and, and African Americans, uh, came here for a better life, right? By choice. They came here often with absolutely nothing. We all know the story, right? I came, they came with the suitcase, the clothes they had on the back, all of that stuff. We have done an experiment that is so profoundly impactful. It's, it's so incredible that we almost can't understand that it happened. We can't understand how much better, I, I really believe this, how much better our ancestors were than us because I don't think that most of our ancestors would be, would be sitting around letting this happen. My two grandfathers who fought in World War II, I'm pretty sure they wouldn't be sitting around. I don't know exactly what they would be doing, but I don't think they would be sitting around letting this happen. And we're all letting it move on us and move on us. And that's why when I say whatever our differences might be, and again, not to diminish them, they are deep, they are deep, but if you would like to save this thing, if you think that America is worth saving, you know, we have, we have half the country seemingly at the moment that does not think that this experiment was good. And, and the irony, of course, is they never leave, right? They always tell you they're gonna leave, they always tell us. It's like, leave, I'll buy Lena Dunham a ticket, go, go already, you know? Let's like get some of the Chelsea Handler, you gotta go. Uh, but they don't leave, and of course they don't leave because they have extraordinary success, extraordinary wealth, extraordinary health, all of these things, things that they only take for granted because of our success. So whatever our you know, political differences are, we've got to put them aside at the moment. And then I would say if we can get some of these wins, so let's say, let's say Yunkin actually wins in Virginia, and it sends a signal, right? It sends a signal across the country, holy cow, Holy cow, maybe there's a, a real pushback against wokeness. You know, the system that we have, the federalist system, that, you know, these states are supposed to operate independently, in some ways it's working at its highest level right now, right? The states are so profoundly different right now that in many ways it's like being in different countries. When I'm in California, it is, it feels dark and depressing and everyone's masked and you can sort of, you know, I, don't, I actually don't leave my house that often uh, because there's just not much to do and I don't feel like being around a lot of these people. But when I do go shopping, you know, you see people and they've got the mask and they kind of look glossed over. They don't look like they're thinking. They, they look deeply depressed. You see this almost everywhere. I live in Los Angeles, which is a, a particular brand of the craziness. Um, but in some ways it shows you that the system's working. These people seemingly want it. 
right? Larry Elder ran a, a great campaign, I think, for, for the recall. It did not go well, obviously. I campaigned with Larry, and the way the media treated Larry, you know, the, the LA Times calling him the black face of white supremacy. I mean, the, the, yeah, like stuff that you truly cannot imagine. Joe Biden showing up a day before the recall, refusing to even say Larry Elder's name and calling him a Trump clone, a man who grew up in South Central LA, the son of a janitor, came from nothing, who has made himself into, I think, one of the, you know, the best public thinkers that we have in the country, the way they dismissed him and attacked him and everything else. Uh, but I mention all that because California seems to want it. They've, they've sort of made their decision. We like this, we like this ever-expanding state, we like the school boards that have complete control over us, uh, we'd rather talk about gender pronouns than fixing the streets or getting the homeless people off the streets or, or the drugs or the crime that's going up. You know, we bring in uh, the DA who ruined San Francisco. I mean, literally, San Francisco, which I was also in San Francisco a couple weeks ago, which is a dystopian nightmare. It looks like Blade Runner. It is just an absolute nightmare. Well, what happened? The DA of San Francisco became the DA of Los Angeles, Bernie back DA, his name's George Gascon, and now you're allowed to, in essence, steal up to, I think it's 850 or $900 worth of stuff, and they will not prosecute you, so you can basically walk into Best Buy and steal a PlayStation 5 and four games, but if you steal a fifth game, then they're gonna get on you. It, it, is, it is just absolutely incredible, but I mention this because the experiment is kind of working. California is getting what it asked for. New York is getting what it asked for. You know, it's funny, as I'm sure many of you know, I was off the grid, I do this August off the grid, no phone, no news, nothing, every year I've done it for five years. When I came back this year on September 1st, Adam Carolla uh, hosted my show and he told me everything that I missed and he told me about Andrew Cuomo uh, in essence being taken out and I didn't know who the lieutenant governor was, I had no idea, I didn't know if it was a man or a woman, I knew absolutely nothing about the person. But I said to him before he even told me anything, I said, I guarantee you, whoever it is, it will be worse. <laughs> and congratulations, New York, it is worse, right? I mean, they're, yeah. So that's the point. The states in many ways are breaking apart. Now, I want to keep this union, right? We're called the United States of America. United is first. We should keep this thing together. We need some of that glue. We've got to do this or we'll be in some sort of perpetual low-grade civil war. That will not be good. The challenge on us, I think, is as the states kind of go in these different directions and as a sort of new, I would say, broader, hopefully conservative movement comes together, the real question will be, well, okay, if certain places, let's say Florida is, is I would say, the, the pinnacle of doing it right, and, and Ron DeSantis, I actually met him last week, I, this is a good, decent man, and I hope he will run for president. I, I hope he will run for president, and, and I also think that whether he does or doesn't, and wherever Trump fits into all that, the crop of Republicans coming up is really, really strong and good and diverse in the right sense, not in the sense of the word that the left uses. Um, but as the states go off in different ways, the challenge will be, okay, so if Florida is going to do it right, and Tennessee is going to do it right, and Texas is going to do it right, well, will the other guys leave us alone? And I don't think the answer is yes. As a matter of fact, I'm sure the answer is no. The more successful that Florida continues to be as it brings in police officers and EMT people and nurses that are getting fired for making personal decisions, as Florida brings them in, yeah. As Florida brings them in and becomes stronger and becomes a state where the rule of law matters and basic truth matters and we're not gonna teach children neo-racism and the rest of it. As these states do these things, and I do think hopefully it will start happening in Virginia now too if today goes well. The other states, they're not gonna be happy with that success. They will, they will not leave that alone. So I think our next challenge that we should start thinking about now is if you live in one of these states, figure out how to defend that state. I, I mean that sort of intellectually, but I mean it sort of physically as well. Figure out how we're gonna make sure that the states are doing it right, uh, are not going to be under endless assault from the states that aren't. Uh, and with all that being said, I do think we can build something very wide right now. And the difference is, again, they are not small. They are not small. Okay, we talked about some deep religious stuff last night. We talked about abortion last night. These are real things. These are important things. But we got to save the country first. I have no doubt that every speaker that you are going to hear for the rest of today and that you've heard over the last couple days uh, wants to live in the same country wants to live in a country 
that has been the great promise. It, it is a dream. It is an extraordinary dream that this thing is here. And we are, we are on the precipice of letting it go. So I think we all have our work to do. And most importantly, and I ended my speech in the VIP room with this yesterday, let's go Brandon. Thank you, everybody. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you, guys. If you're looking for more honest and thoughtful conversations about politics instead of nonstop yelling, check out our politics playlist. And if you want to watch full interviews on a variety of topics, watch our full episode playlist all right over here. And to get notified of all future videos, be sure to subscribe and click the notification bell.